Welcome back to A Stoic Plays, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Total War Attila. And I know what you're thinking. Marcus, you're the guy who is all things Byzantine. So what is this we're looking at? This is definitely not the Eastern Romans. And you're right, this is not the Eastern Romans. In my spare time, I do like to mess around with other nations and playing around in this game. I put 115 hours in my Eastern Roman campaign, which is a lot and definitely worth the money I paid for Attila. But, you know, I like to get even more money's worth by playing different factions. And I messed around a bit with the Evdanians, conquered the British Isles. That was fun. But then I wanted to try out the Slavs DLC. And that's where we are today. The Slavs come with three different nations, and I chose the Venetians. And the reason for that is the other two nations, one of them, their main strength was they were really good at fighting the Huns, or rather nomadic factions in general. And the other one, their main strength was, I think, ambushing in the forest or just something very situational. But what makes the Venetians cool, and the reason why I wanted to play them, is their faction traits are quite interesting. Let's pull up. So, the Venetians are in touch with the ground, which means that their farms do not cause any squalor penalty. Now, you'll remember as the Eastern Romans, this was a big pain in the butt because you never had enough food. Well, with the Venetians, that is not a problem that you suffer from. They are also, they derive 100% more income from farms. So basically farms have doubled income. Now to make up for that, they get half income from commerce, industry, and culture. Now I'm working with a mod right now. I forget who made it or what it's called. But the purpose of it, and I got it from the Steam Workshop, is that apparently there is a bug with the Venetians that Creative Assembly has chosen for one reason or another not to fix. They might not know about it, because I doubt they check their own forums, or they might feel that it's not actually a bug, that it's working as intended. But what it is, is that you only get this 100% bonus from farms for the entry-level farm, the first farm you build. And then if you upgrade that farm into something else, you lose that bonus. So the mod that I have maintains that bonus throughout all of the different farm tree. And all Slavs get the Hardy Warriors trait, which gives a 50% bonus less. That is, you pay only 50% for your main settlement buildings. You are all immune to snow attrition. Now there was like, for example, the Abdanians, I believe there was a tech you could research that would get you that. But with these guys, you're just born with it naturally. And finally, and this is the most important thing, because if you watched my Eastern Roman playthrough, you will note that it was ridiculously expensive to resettle a devastated province. It was something like 20,000 gold. Well, these guys can do it for free. All it takes are men. So, as you can see from this, the gameplay is quite different than what we were used to with the Eastern Romans. Primarily, you start off here in Germano Sarmatia. The way to play as the Slavs, rather than fighting and conquering and all that business, is simply just to colonize everything, which is what I have done. Now, we are almost near the end here. We are in 432. Remember, the game ends at 450. I went through the vast majority of this game without having to fight anyone. If you'll notice, my western borders with the Germanic tribes are exactly the same as they were when the game started. I simply colonized desolate land and maintained my borders. And for the longest time, I was able to avoid the Huns because there's this uh, cool chain of events that happens if you are the Slavs where they come to you and ask you for tribute. And you can say yes or no. And I said yes, I gave them food. You can give them food or money. And it grows. So they come back a little bit later and they ask for more. And they finally ask for more. So this carried me throughout almost the entire history. 
all the way past the birth of Attila, all the way past when Attila became a man, but finally they just asked for too much. And I said, screw you Huns and the horses that you rode in on. And I am, uh, I'm suffering from that decision now because the thing is, I don't know if you've played Attila, but if you have, you'll know, the Huns are very cheap. And what I mean by that is, they just randomly spawn multiple full stack armies throughout the game for no reason. Now, I understand that historically the Huns were a big pain in the ass and that they scared the hell out of everybody and they were quite powerful. But as far as I do understand, they did not have magic powers that allowed them to teleport right next to, you know, the Slavs' capital. They had to at least come from somewhere. And they don't do that here. They just teleport right here in your main province and head straight for your capital which is a big pain in the junk, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you. And so, despite the fact that we have put down something like 10 full-stack Slav armies, including Attila, who's currently running around somewhere with just himself, I think. he's There he is. There's good old, good old Attila. They just keep coming. They just keep coming. There's three full-stack armies in my main area. It's atrocious. It makes me very upset. But I fight them off. Now, luckily, as the Slavs, you do have an ace in the hole. And what that is, is your archers have this amazing ability. Now, they don't have the fire arrows and the whistling arrows and the heavy arrows that the normal people do. Or at least the Eastern Romans had and the Abdanians had. They only have one kind of arrow. But it's a good one. It's poison. And what it does is any unit that is hit by it becomes immediately exhausted. So, the way I've been able to just take out the Huns left and right is certain settlements of the Slavs, and I mean the little settlements, the villages, not the walled cities, have this amazing setup where, if you can just imagine it, they have a cylindrical, or not cylindrical, like an oval, I'm talking two, two dimensions here, they have an oval wall around this main hill in the center of the settlement, and there are two openings, one on each side. Think of it as left and right. But in order to get to those openings, the enemy has to come from, if we're still imagining this in 2D, the north. So they have to come up to your wall, and then they get to choose to either turn left or turn right, where they walk around your wall to try to get in from the side. And there's area on this wall for archers to stand. So you basically line up all your archers on this wall, and they get free shots at every single person that's coming up to your main I guess, headquarters of your settlement, so that by the time they reach your troops who are guarding the two entrances, which are pretty decent spearmen, they're already whittled down by your archers and exhausted. So they run almost immediately. It's amazing. I was able to take down a full stack Hun army, suffering pretty much no casualties whatsoever. However, not every settlement is like this. There's this one settlement which just causes intense rage, where the main hill that you're located on has multiple avenues to it, wide avenues too, so you can't even block them off with spearmen, it's, it's just this wide open kind of area, and those particular settlements are impossible to defend. Even if you were attacked by an army that was roughly the same size as you, you're still going to get rocked like a hurricane. So you just have to get lucky, you have to have the Huns attack you in the city where you can maximize your strengths. One of them is here in Romula. Romula has been good to me. Apulium, or Apulum, has been good to me. Unfortunately, this city here was not good to me. It got raised by the Huns. There's another full-stack Hun army there. So it's been pretty rough. But let's look at the Venetian building tree. So, well, I guess it's not a very good idea to look at my capital because it's currently being sieged by the Huns, but our Hymar is a pretty good example. So... Now remember, your farms are free in terms of squalor. And so, and also you get tons of money from them. So you're definitely wanting to have farms everywhere. What I typically do is build a farm in all three provinces of the region. Even the walled one, which remember as the Romans, I don't believe you were even able to do. But as the Slavs, you can. In addition to that, the Slavs have a building called a, well, it's, it's a canal right now, but it starts off as a well, and then a trough, and then a dike, and then a canal. And it adds sanitation, which is fantastic. And then finally, what's really awesome 
about the Slavs is the Temple of Mokosh, which improves public order, improves growth, which since you're starting many of your settlements from scratch is really important. It also influences your religion, which is great. It allows you to recruit priests. And finally, most importantly, it aids fertility. So unlike the Romans who were struggling for every little bit of food they could get, the Venetians run an incredible food surplus. And that is really important because they need food for everything. So your religious buildings, for example, the Temple of Mokosh, requires food. The Zadriga complex actually creates squalor, but it's also great. Your main buildings require a ton of food. And your other religious building, the city-based religious building... Do I have one here? I do not. Let's see here. I know I have one somewhere. Here it is. It starts off being the Sacred Grove of Perun, then the Shrine of Perun, the Temple, the Sanctuary of Perun, and the Temple of Perun. It requires a ton of food as well. So much food, actually, that I've rarely upgraded it all the way. It's really not as useful as the Temple of Mokosh. I mean, it still does the same things. It improves public order. It improves the influence of your religion. It also does osmosis, which I guess is really good. But what's cool about it is it enables an ability called Last Stand on all Slavic units as long as you're inside the province where it exists. However, the level 1 version does this, so you don't really need to upgrade all the way. And I typically don't. I don't really like the Shrine of Perun all that much. There's also a building in the city called... It starts off being a granary, then a stores, then a sioux su terrain, and then finally a smokehouse, which provides sanitation and food. The sanitation, though, only for that one city, whereas the dikes or wells or canals provide sanitation for the entire region. So the combination of the two of them being that you never, unlike playing as the Romans, you never have to deal with any type of sanitation problem whatsoever. So my build structure is very typical. A farm in each one, a Temple of Mokosh in one of them, a Zadriga in the other. I try very hard to get the Zadriga and the dikes in the same one. It looks like I was not able to do that in this one because there is a resource here, wood. And then I always try to get one main building in each one. So the main building is kind of an interesting path here. You, first you build the town center, which provides public order. But then you have to choose between a meeting hall and a market stall. The meeting hall is kind of your government path. So you can go with research, which the Great Hall and the Hall of Elders gives you. And that's about it, just some money and public order. You could go through the Tavern and Mead Hall path, which gives you more wealth, more public order. However, it consumes a ton of food, but it gives you immigration, uh, reduction of immigration penalties. So kind of useful, but not really. What's really useful about this path, and the only reason why I go down it sometimes, is because it gives you a special unit called the Followers of Velis, which are high-armored elite axemen. And then you have finally the Government path, which is the Warlord's Hold, the Warlord's Keep, and the Warlord's Castle, which unfortunately these two, the Keep and the Castle, are like literally the second to last and the last technology you research in the Civics research part. So it's kind of worthless. I mean, you can't even build these things until the very, very end, and one comes immediately after the other. So if you're researching normally, you'll probably have this guy up for maybe 10 turns max before you move up to this guy. But it does provide Slavic champions, and also the Agent champion which is the only way you get the Agent Champion, so you definitely need to build this chain at some point. And finally, even though you get less money from commerce and trade and industry, you do want to at least produce one of these somewhere because it gives you spies, which is why I'm doing that here. Again, you don't get much money for it. In most cases, I would avoid this entirely, but the addition of spies obviously makes it very necessary. And that's about that. Uh, my favorite farm is the goat farm because it gives really good food and a lot of money. And remember, your money is doubled. Now, the fields aren't even worth it. They give you just a very small and slight amount of food and you lose a ton of money. Not worth it at all. Plus, you get to recruit the same unit. Now, I occasionally will do the livestock pen because it gives you a different garrison item. The cavalry... Skirmisher cavalry units, Farog's raiders. Well, actually, there's Farog's raiders now. They used to just be Slavic raiders. 
and it gives you a lot more money too. Which is pretty hilarious because these are obviously cows. So why cows would somehow allow you to recruit cavalry is beyond me. I'm pretty sure the Slavic cavalry are not riding around on cows. But, uh, yeah. I guess, no, that's a cow too. I guess these cows magically morph into horses when necessary. When danger strikes and you need them to. And that's really about it for the Slavs. Now, obviously, you want to also have a... They're not called industry, but they're, like, called craftsmen. Let's see. Here we go. So there's the craftsman tree, and you need this because, unlike the Romans, where it just gives you money, in the Slavic tree, they give you units that you can't get otherwise. For example, Slavic axe warriors from the artisan, Slavic large shields from the smithy, and... The Hunters, your only ranged unit from the Woodcarver. So it, I played like half of the time period of the game before I even had Archer units. Because it was just such a unnecessary thing to go down the Artisan path. Because what you really need is sanitation from the wells. And food, obviously, from the farms and your temples. So by the time all that's built, you're just waiting for population to grow. Because population just grows so slowly. Even with all your growth bonuses. Now, why is the sanitation here bad? Negative two. It must be some weird thing because it's winter, because I have plenty of sanitation. This only does squalor two, squalor four, so that's six, eight, and that's it. Eight, negative, whereas this thing by itself creates nine. So why somehow I have 15 squalor doesn't make any sense. This should only be eight max. So something's going on here that I don't understand. Some game mechanic that I'm not particularly well versed in is creating a whole shit ton of additional squalor that I am not I'm not sure why it's happening. Maybe it's because Samandar has been beat up a little bit. I'm fixing that. We'll see. So the political situation is kind of a pain as well. When I was simply hanging out in my little area, everything was fine. But now I've got the Sassanids and all of their satrapies at war with me. And they're actually seeing some great success down here in Caucasia, where the Armenians just send stack after stack after stack. They're very powerful. They have like five. Well, they used to have five. Now they have four. It looks like they were taken over by these rebels. But they just keep sending men at me, and I keep trying to fight them off. But it's just... It's so hard. You know, I love Total War games. I really enjoy them, and I love the battles too. But after you fought your 50th battle defending the same settlement... You just want to auto-resolve. You just want to get past it. But the problem is the game punishes you for auto-resolving. Because if you fight the battle yourself, you'll crush the enemy. But if you auto-resolve that exact same battle, they'll crush you. It's not even close. I wish the game was at least somewhat fair and smart. And was able to see how you do when you fight a battle. And then use that to predict how it fights the battle when you want to auto-resolve. Because again, fighting the same battle with the same troops and the same settlement against the same stacks of enemies over and over and over again is incredibly frustrating. So the way out of that is to auto-resolve and move on. But the game screws up auto-resolve so badly, and this is not this is not a criticism of Attila per se, because it also did this in Medieval 2 and all the other Total War games. They want to force you to fight the battle. And then they, they always say cute little things like, well, auto-resolving is like letting the battle be fought without a leader, la la la. But the point is, it's not people just being lazy. It's people, you know, getting tired of just fighting the same battle over and over again. It, it's It's tedious. And so they really need to come up with a way to make auto-resolve somewhat reasonable. If you as the player can crush the enemy on the field of battle, then at the very least the auto-resolve should win. Now, I'm not saying it should crush the enemy, but it it shouldn't be a situation where if you fight the battle, you absolutely destroy them and don't lose anything, but if you auto-resolve, you lose everything and they don't lose anything. Like that's such a swing that it doesn't make sense and whatever algorithm this game uses to determine the strength of your stacks just doesn't doesn't carry water, in my opinion. And that's, I'm sorry, that's my rant. That's my rant for this episode on the auto-resolve. And the reason why is because I love the game. 
and I want to keep playing it, but I get disgusted after fighting the same battle over and over again, and I just want to stop. And so I stop playing, and that's not right. That's not, that's not good. Obviously, you want to enjoy the game, you want to keep playing it. Uh, these guys are my allies. This is the other Slavic faction. There were three. The uh, first one, I have all their lands. They were in Transcarpathia. I didn't hurt them. They just got taken over by rebels and Huns, and I kind of reconquered the lands. These guys, it was actually one of the goals of this campaign, the objectives that they set for you to conquer these guys, but I just, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Even though they have the main province of this, and so they have the big city, they're just such good guys. They've been loyal to me since the beginning. Their stacks have fought off the Huns for me, and they, they really like me, and so I just, I couldn't bring myself to just declare war on them for no reason. I've tried to uh, facilize them. They don't want to do that. And you know what? That's fine with me. They're, again, they're good guys. They're the Slovenians. Yeah, the Slovenians. And also, I like having them around because they're the ones that have the bonus against the nomadic tribes. So their stacks are especially effective against the Huns. So it's good to have them around. So I'm at war with the Persians. I'm at war with the Eastern Romans, unfortunately. I guess they declared war on me when I took Dacia. I didn't really want Dacia, but the reason I had to take it was because in order to... The victory conditions for the Slavs is quite unique. Unlike the Romans, where you have to have a certain number of territories and defeat a certain number of enemies, the victory condition for the Slavs is simply to have your legendary building. Level 1 of it is the Totem of the Wolf, or you could then go to the Shrine of Svarog, or the Temple of the Blazing Wolves, or the Temple of the Shimmering Wolves. So that's how you win, is by creating this building. And this building is incredibly expensive. Let me see if I can find it on the building browser. That's not the building browser. Dun, 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 dun. Legendary. Okay. So, first of all, the thing costs 50000 to produce, which is fine. I have plenty of money. My farms are bringing in lots of money. It also costs 1000 to maintain. Again, easy peasy. And it's amazing. It gives you a recruitment capacity of plus two for your whole empire. It gives you 50 Imperium points, and it gives you a higher tax rate. But here's the kicker. You have to control a wood resource and an iron resource, which was, in my case, that meant either having to conquer Dacia for their iron or Transcaspia down here. Now, looking back on it, since I was already at war with the Sassanids, I should have just done this. But I decided not to because I figured this was a really good zone to block them off. And I figured I'd be safe if I took this. Plus it would strengthen me against the Huns. I was wrong. And it also caused the Eastern Romans to attack me. So I'm in this weird position right now where the Eastern Romans hate the Huns. The Sassanids hate the Huns. But instead of thinking, hey, these cool Slavic guys are fighting off the Huns for us. They're declaring war on me as well. So the three largest powers in the game are currently laying waste to me from all directions, and I'm doing everything I can to fight them off, all because I needed iron to build this wonder, which, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot even build. Because the final thing that you need to build it, and I guess I have to go back to the building browser, is you need every single province that you control to have 70% of your religion. And so I shot myself in the foot. No one's fault but my own. I expanded so fast that I don't have that. I mean, some of these areas just aren't 70% my religion. Now, if I had kept it to a small little empire and just kind of built up in silence without trying to really expand and do great things, I could have easily built my wonder and already have won the game. But I didn't. So now I have to worry about fighting off hordes of marauding Huns who miraculously teleport right next to my capital. This is about where they appear. These Romans and the Sassanids, all while trying to spread my religion so that I could build my wonder and win the game. It's quite challenging. And I'm actually, despite my little rant about the auto-resolve, which applies to every faction, not just the Venetians, I'm actually really enjoying it and loving it. The Slavs are a fun little faction. I downloaded a skin for them. I think it's by a guy named Avetis, A-V-E-T-I-S. It's better Slav skins, and it's really cool. We're out of time, so I'm not going to be showing you a battle here. But uh, they're really good-looking, really good-looking Slavs, you know. They're just very handsome, very handsome, mustachioed Slavs. And uh, I look forward to continuing this, and hopefully, if I'm successful in defeating the Huns, 
I can raise my state religion and get the victory point. And then I'll have yet another achievement listed for Attila. So, anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Just wanted to give you this taste to show that I'm not just an Eastern Roman guy. It's not all I do always. I do like to get some diversity in there every once in a while. So once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening to me rant. <laughs> just a little. Just a little. I love I love the Slavs. I love the Venetians. I love the game. But you know, nothing's perfect. Everybody's got their, their own wants and needs. <laughs> so thank you for watching. Have a good one.